Hey everyone, John Stimval from BackstageWell.com here, and today we're doing something a little different for you all. Uh, I know we normally talk movies, we normally talk with the biggest stars, you know, for all the films that are coming out. We just started our Artist Spotlight this past week uh, with AWOL. I recommend you go check that out if you, if you haven't already. Uh, but today we're doing something a little different, like I said. So Afghanistan has been all over the news, and no one, you can't really miss it, you know? And so I myself have had a lot of questions about these refugees that have been flown out of Kabul airport and are now coming to the United States. And so what I did is I went and I sat down with this U.S. Marine. His name is Patrick Cronin. And Patrick right now is working to get three families of interpreters. So these are individuals that worked with our U.S. armed forces on the ground in Afghanistan in combat and helped interpret, um, and they worked hand in hand together. They risked their own lives and they risked their families' lives in order to do this. And I know I've seen stuff and you may as well have seen some, um, some comments and things on social media on both sides, you know, that we should be bringing these people over. And then also people that are worried about the vetting process, you know, and what could, be, what could happen if uh, we do bring these people over and they're not vetted properly? And so I sat down with Patrick and we talked about this. We talked about his service. We talked about the families that are coming over, uh, the vetting process, some of the concerns that I know a lot of us have. And we also talked about how we can help these families as well. Because I know a lot of times there's these huge issues that are occurring in the world. And we as individuals feel like there's nothing we can do. But any movement starts with an individual. And so we discuss that as well. So here is Backstage World's interview with Patrick Cronin talking about Afghanistan interpreters and them coming over here to the United States. And then in the coming weeks, we will also have the said interpreters that Patrick is talking about in this interview joining us here on BackstageWorld.com to share their experience. Uh, if you are interested in donating or helping out these families, all the links are below. So go ahead, click those links, check them out, read their stories. And this is our interview with Patrick Cronin. Patrick, it's great to talk to you today. How's it going, man? It's, it's going well. Looking forward to this, uh, this long weekend. Yeah, man, it's, it's going to be a good one. So I want to talk to you about your experience in Afghanistan, your branch of service, uh, kind of like what your focus was over there. And sure. then um, and then afterwards, we'll talk about how you ended up getting linked up with the interpreters over there. Yeah. So um, when I, I went to Afghanistan, uh, 2012 to 2013, um, I deployed with um, a United States Marine Corps unit out of the 1st Marine Division um, as a, a field artillery um, advisor, foreign military advisor to the first brigade, 215th Corps, uh, ANA, uh, based out of, uh, Camp Dwyer in Afghanistan. I spent most of my time, uh, kind of away from that parent command at a more austere base. I worked with, you know, um, a whole Kandak, which is a, that's the Dari word for a battalion. So we trained approximately 600 to 700 uh, Afghan National Army soldiers in everything from logistics to uh, field artillery. Uh, there was actually a reconnaissance element that was at yet another base, uh, but it, it rolled up underneath uh, the same unit that I was advising. So again, during my time there with them, we, we trained, we did patrolling with them, uh, we, we did all, we planned all their operations with them. Um, we taught them, you know, we had to bridge a cultural gap. We had to bridge a religious gap. We had to even, uh, bridge an educational gap. Some of these soldiers that we were training were, uh, illiterate. So we actually taught just basic, uh, courses to them. And that was all enabled through approximately, um, a dozen linguists. Uh, specifically, I worked very close with uh, three of them, and I, I've maintained very, very close uh, contact relationship with, with two of them. So again, spent a year over there, um, took, 
you know, had a unit that was being trained but wasn't really autonomous a piece of the pie with the field artillery. Um, they were completely autonomous. Um, to use a kind of a cliche military term, they were able to shoot, move, and communicate. And they were, uh, you know, they were being implemented into named combat operations, which was a really, really big deal um, from where they started. Their baseline was just, you know, rudimentary training, um, not really doing a whole lot. And then by the end of it, they were moving around the, the, the battle space a little bit and providing, you know, fire support for their, uh, their infantry and recon brethren, if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. So they're pretty much like, uh, in a way, like villagers or like just people in the city or the surrounding areas that you're taking that were of fighting age and uh, with no prior experience, more than likely, unless you had some of the older gentlemen that fought, you know, in the early 80s. Uh, but for the most part, they were probably brand new to all this, right? Correct. They were they were a very young um, fighting force, not only from their age, but just they were to me, they were in their inf infancy of, you know, coming together and, uh, and behaving as a, you know, cohesive, mature unit. What was the importance besides the actual job of an interpreter? But from a lot of research I've done, a lot of U.S. military forces couldn't even move on the ground without having some type of Afghan uh, military unit with them. Is that correct? Yeah. So... And are you talk now? Are you talking about we couldn't move without a you know an Afghan unit? Or are you talking about the linguists, uh, like a linguist or like someone with them? Like I've been reading, uh, for example, like Jocko Willing's book Extreme Ownership, yeah. and he's been he talks a lot about how they have to have a Afghan some type of Afghan element with them, or it makes it easier to get their missions approved by the higher command uh, if yeah. you have that type of element with you. Yeah. So you're, so you're absolutely right. So like, I, I didn't go, I didn't go anywhere without my linguist. Right. So just, just think about their, their, their translating documents for you. They're, you know, essentially glued to your hip. Um, you know, my, one of my linguists, Naveed, uh, who I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about later that uh, he, he would, he would go above and beyond. Right. So like if anything was, getting kind of sketchy if there was kind of like a, you know, a, um, uh, you know, a peculiar situation arising or something didn't feel right. Uh, you know, he'd kind of tap me and say, Hey, it's, uh, you know, it's time to go. But in terms of what, like, I could not have done my job without Naveed. There's no way. I mean, the, that Afghan unit, the, the sizable unit that it was could not have gotten to where they were without these linguists, um, translating documents, translating every single, uh, you know, conversation that you're having. So, um, yeah, I mean, just literally could not have done, we would have been stuck in the mud had we not had their help. What were some of the cultural differences and similarities that I guess you would play off of? Um, like, what were some of the biggest challenges? And then what was maybe something that surprised you that wasn't nearly as difficult as you expected? So, I think people are, are, are people uh, at the end of the day. Um, I know that they're so during the workup, uh, the, like the pre-deployment training and stuff like that, all of the uh, instructors said, you know, you have to be very, very careful um, from everything as minute as how you like present the bottom of, of your foot or the sole of your shoe. Um, obviously, you don't want to direct that towards uh, anybody. But something, something like that to, um, you know, as big picture as, you know, don't talk about religion or, or, or God. I remember very distinctly uh, when, we, when the Afghan artillery unit that I was uh, training, we, we got very comfortable uh, with each other. And I remember we were having a lot of success towards the end of the deployment. And uh, we were providing illumination uh, rounds in support of the, the recon toli or the recon company that was located in Marja. And uh, I just remember that night being, I, I won't forget that night, we were, uh, you know, that the ANA uh, recon unit was calling in fire support. We were giving it timely and accurately. And that recon unit was able to, um, 
essentially when they would never op they would not have operated at night because they just didn't have the the night vision capabilities but if, now that we're providing illumination they're able to conduct their operations at night and the the whole deal was uh you know the taliban would meet at a place uh, at night and now we've disrupted their ability to have those those meetings and and prepare for their own operations by you know influencing them at night and i just remember everybody was in such a good mood uh, we were talk talking about all of the the the, the quote unquote no go topics uh, with ease, and it was it was really really enjoyable to hear um, their thoughts on religion and 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 God. So I, I, I remember to answer your question. I think that was something that you know I was going in there with like you know that no go criteria in my head. Just do not talk about this whatsoever. And because we got so comfortable with each other and we were working so well with each other, we did have that conversation and it was actually, um, it was a very positive thing over, overall. Yeah. I mean, it's great that y'all got to be so comfortable with, with each other, but it's also because y'all are working together. Y'all been fighting together. Y'all are laying down y'all's lives together. And so for right. y'all to be able to actually, you know, break that ice in a way um, is really incredible. I want to talk a little bit about the resilience of the Afghani people and then also some of the motivation for these people to go out and risk their lives. Like I told you earlier, my neighbor served a couple of tours in Afghanistan and his interpreter, the reason that he sure. became an interpreter is because the Taliban had killed his wife and his children. They, had, they killed his entire family. And so he decided to make the switch. What was... what? I'm sure there's not just one leading factor because they all have their own stories, but what was maybe a common ground that united right. them to fight against the Taliban? Well, I'll tell you, their, their common ground um, is wanting a, uh, a better country without war. Um, these three Afghans um, are posting uh, continuously about the, uh, the Northern Alliance resistance in uh, the Pangea here, uh, River Valley. Uh, all three are unanimously motivated uh, by, you know, Masood's son that's leading this, this next charge. Um, so I think, you know, what bonds them all together, and they kind of mentioned in their, in their stories, uh, they just want a, they want a country without the infighting. They want, uh, they, they want a chance to, um, to legitimize themselves without, uh, you know, the Taliban um, assert, inserting itself and asserting itself. So I think they, I think they want to they want a country without war. Uh, one of the stories was told uh, that you know the fighting started when when one of these linguists was was won and it hasn't hasn't stopped. So um, yeah, they just they just want a shot at living living free, living peacefully. Um, I, so I think that's probably what, you know, bonds them all together. Okay. I want to get into bringing uh, the interpreters over here and the importance for that, because I see some people on social that support it. And then I'm seeing other people who are against it. Um, obviously, I think if someone goes and lays down their life and is willing to risk their lives to help what we're uh, trying to, uh, our mission over there that we need to help protect them, you know, but there's also people that are saying that we don't need yeah. to bring them to the States, you know, um, there's all these other issues that could arise. What do you say to those people that have that maybe point of view as like, we should just leave them there or we're going to end up having more terrorist attacks here in the States. What do you say to those people that are against it on social media? I understand their vetting concerns. Um, I also know, um, I know a little bit about the vetting process and what was being used over there. I, I would, I can speak to my three families. I, I am reasonably uh, assured, very confident um, that we're, there are no issues with my three families, um, but I can understand that everybody has a vetting concern. There was a lot of people processed in a very short period of time, but I can also speak towards uh, just kind of knowing some of the, the folks that were in the room and some of the, 
systems that they were using in order to vet on the ground there. And then keep in mind, right, so after they were manifested on a flight from uh, Harmon Karzai International Airport, they spent significant time uh, in a third party country uh, going over, I'm sure going through an um, even more intense, uh, you know, vetting process and background check. So yeah, I, I, I can understand both sides of it. Um, I can tell you that uh, these, the, the, fo the, especially my three families, and I know that there's countless of other, uh, you know, veteran stories that are, that are sim similar to mine that they wanted to get their people out. The, like Naveed, I'm going to speak to, to Naveed, my linguist. He was with me everywhere I went. Um, if things got hairy, he was right there with me. Um, in good and in bad, he was right there with me. He's still here, right here with me. We go to dinner frequently. Um, he's an, he is one of the best people I've ever met. His, his heart is good. His heart is pure. He's just a good dude. He's a, he's a good person. Uh, his family's wonderful. Uh, you know, he's looking to be sworn in as a, a U.S. citizen uh, on the 22nd. Uh, he's got his wife over here now. Um, just had a brand new uh, baby boy. I mean, he, he's a truck driver now, uh, you know, making, you know, decent money. He's rocking and rolling and I, he's just salt of the earth. So uh, again, I understand that, you know, a lot of people process short amount of time. People are, are concerned that maybe, you know, some onesies and twosies slip through. Uh, my families are good to go. Uh, Naveed is one of the best people I've ever met on planet earth. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pretty confident. I think a lot of us will feel this way that we see these problems and they seem so big and they're like there's nothing i can do like as an individual my what i what i can do like it's not going to make a difference but i really truly believe that like you can fix these macro these huge problems on a on the individual level that's where it all begins so what can the average american do to help these people um and not only just coming over here, but maybe help setting up their lives over here, or actually what resources, maybe a better question would be, what resources do they need? And then how can the average person help them get those? So after talking with a number of uh, charitable organizations and non-for-profits, uh, my eyes have been opened. Um, some, uh, some assumptions even confirmed. Um, I I'll tell you, when I, when I was doing the, uh, when I was in these, you know, working groups trying to get these families out, um, it, it seemed like not one family, not one package or packet, uh, sometimes they were referred to, went the same way. Uh, now that we're working on getting them uh, from their third party country into the States, and after talking with these non-for-profits and charitable organizations, some small, some large, they're kind of confirming the same thing that they've worked with countless refugees from all kinds of different countries uh, to include Afghanistan. And they said that there's normally been a process to all of this. Uh, paperwork is, you know, uh, standard uh, across the board. They're saying this go around. Some families don't get the same paperwork that others do. Uh, what I'm hearing is that, you know, each, each uh, family, each, uh, refugee sometimes is, is, is processed differently. Uh, so you ask about resources. Um, I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to set up, you know, an, a, a intimate level of care, uh, for these three families, uh, you know, intimate level of care and attention so that they get so they get the resources they, that they need and they're not necessarily overlooked by, by a large organization. And I'm not saying that that uh, uh, is the rule. I'm sure it's certainly the exception, but I'd rather not risk it as, just because I'm like, you know, connected to these, to these families in, in, a, in a close manner. So um, I, I can just tell you what we're doing. Um, I, I thought to myself when I was, you know, now that I knew that I was going to be in, you know, essentially the one to, how do I say this? I felt that I would be the one receiving these families uh, for, for lack of a better term, when they finally get over here and they're being processed and they're getting set up, I felt a sense of responsibility to help them myself. And 
Uh, I thought the best way to do that was essentially set up a way to ensure that the foundational levels of Maslow's hierarchy were, um, what I'm trying to say is I set up, you know, uh, a Facebook account, just trying to get food, water, uh, shelter, just that, that foundational level kind of going up, uh, maybe one level into the financial side of it a little bit with the GoFundMe's just, just give them have something here that can, you know, afford them just those basic human needs uh, while they're getting work through the system. I hope that makes sense. hundred percent. Absolutely. What are some of the ambitions and goals of some of these other families? You, you told me one is already working. Uh, he's a truck driver. Uh, like what are their goals? You know? Yeah. So uh, Naveed, who I'm most close with, uh, is also very close with the second family. Um, you know, he goes by, you know, the name of Mac. Um, so Naveed and Mac are very close. They're aspiring truck drivers. Uh, Naveed got his uh, CDL uh, sooner than Mac did. Mac had to go down to Florida to get his CDL and they're out driving somewhere, you know, on the East Coast right now. Um, the last one, James, uh, I, I'm sure he his aspirations are just to get his wife and, and kid over here along with his uh, mother and father. And I think he's also got a little brother in tow as well. I would say unanimously, they want their families to, to be here. That's what they're used to uh, large families under the, you know, the same, the same roof. So, um, you know, Naveed and Mac, I certainly know better than uh, James, the last one. They seem to be pretty industrious. Uh, they're they're very. Uh, uh, they they seem like they're getting somewhat more capitalistic as the day goes on here. They're they're wanting to uh, to get some miles underneath their belt, do well with their uh, with their their hauling uh, endeavors, and then eventually go into business together and uh buy their own truck so they kind of they own that you know entire supply chain and i it, it's great for them I, I hope that they uh can you know put a little uh kitty aside and, and go get themselves a, a truck together and have their own fleet one day how cool would that be that would be awesome i mean talk about a success story right there that'd be incredible uh patrick is there anything that i'm missing here is there anything else that we need to talk about that we need to add about this story that you would like me to include yeah, so uh, I I have um, I have a Facebook group that I'm using to uh, coordinate a lot of uh, the resources, the donations, uh, whether it's you know a material donation or whether it's a uh, financial donation. I, I do have a Facebook set up. It's got all three families in the featured stories. So as soon as you hit that landing page, um, you're able to read the stories of each uh, family as well as um, reach their GoFundMe. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I guess I would love the ability to get the word out, uh, cast the net, um, you know, large, uh, larger than we are already right now. It's pretty, it's a pretty grassroots uh, effort at this point. It's, you know, somewhat in its infancy at this point. So yeah, I would, I would love to be able to direct people towards that Facebook page so that they can uh, by one, simply one click, um, get onto those GoFundMe's and read the stories uh, and find out who they'd be supporting, the, just the genuinely shirt off your back, good people that they would be supporting. And what's the name of that Facebook page? So um, it's Afghan uh, Resettlement Project uh, Dash or hyphen Houston. Thank you for uh, sharing this story with us. We're going to have all the links below. Uh, yeah. I'm actually going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and get this up. And so we can go ahead and get, get it running and start helping get some donations in. And then I would love to talk to um, Naveed, Mac, um, all, everybody. Uh, when Absolutely. And, and they've, they've promised that they'll, they'll, that they'll be able to do that for you. Perfect, man. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. I think what you're doing is incredible. Thank you for your service. And anything else that you need, just hit me up. You have my email and uh, we'll help you out, man. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Jonathan.